It's my pleasure to uh, welcome you to this uh, webinar organized in the context of Instruct ERIC, a pan-European research infrastructure providing access to high-end uh, services and technologies. And this, uh, as you know, happens through several means, ranging from funding research visits to providing support for training, internships, or uh, pilot projects uh, for research and development, and offering a wide variety of uh, different uh, services, uh, ranging from sample preparation, which is very specific for the different technologies, all the way to uh, the final 3D structural and dynamic analysis. And today, the focus uh, uh, will be on uh, um, presenting highlights by guests of uh, our research infrastructure, which uh, uh, is uh, uh, focusing mainly on NMR spectroscopy. And as you see here, it uh, uh, can uh, provide access to instruments ranging from really low fields, uh, namely relaxometers, all the way to the highest uh, magnetic field available now, 1.2 gigahertz. And uh, it's uh, also very close, it's in the heart of Tuscany and very close to the Florence airport, so it should be easily accessible by researchers in the scientific community. And uh, um, before uh, giving the word to our uh, speakers, just a final reminder about the uh, Congress that will uh, soon take place in the Netherlands. And as you see here, uh, today we're just writing the deadline for abstract submission. So if you're interested, just uh, uh, go ahead and submit an abstract and uh, uh, participate to this meeting. So uh, now uh, I would like uh, to uh, give the word to uh, Barbara Zambelli from the University of Bologna, who will uh, tell us uh, um, about an application of uh, NMR to study intrinsically disordered regions of proteins, a particularly interesting one that has uh, implications for uh, lung cancer. So please, uh, uh, Barbara, let me stop sharing and uh, give you the screen. Share my screen. Does it work? Perfect. Good. So uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm going to uh, present my work uh, on, uh, on uh, a protein that I recently started to study. So this is quite a, a new work. Uh, and part of, of it was, uh, um, was uh, could be done uh, thanks to the uh, access to the CERM uh, infrastructure uh, through Instruct uh, support. So um, I'm very happy to, to show this data about this protein, this new protein. Uh, so um, my research, uh, this with nickel and the effect of nickels on human health. Nickel is uh, toxic and carcinogenic for humans and for um, higher organisms, mammals normally, but is also essential for life, especially for uh, bacteria and unicellular organisms. But if we look at the um, and the proteins involved in, in, uh, in nickel health uh, and nickel pathogenesis, we can see that the majority of them, the, no, the, 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 of them, the known ones, are involved in infection. So are uh, pathogenic factors of bacteria or uh, pathogens for human body. Uh, some of them are, are also involved in cancer, especially in lung cancer, because uh, nickel is uh, a known carcinogen for uh, nasal and lung. Um, and uh, and the, the other problem that nickel causes to humans is allergy, uh, as allergy is the, the one of the most, uh, uh, nickel allergy was one of the most diffuse uh, allergies uh, in the human population. Looking in, at the cancer uh, effect, a uh, carcinogenic effect uh, of nickel, we can see that nickel compounds enter the cell using usually a mechanism for other metal ions, such as calcium or iron. And in the cytoplasm, um, 
nickel can bind other proteins in a non-physiological way, so substituting other metal ions in the active site of, of other proteins. Uh, it can go into it, it can go into the nucleus. Uh, and cause uh, uh, epigenetic damage, so by uh, interacting with histones or, or met histone methylases, uh, um, so uh, it can impair the transcription of, of genes. And uh, one of the um, most peculiar effect of nickel is to induce an hypoxia response. Usually, hypoxia response occurs in, car in cancer carcinogenic cells uh, that feels uh, uh, that oxygen is not present. Uh, usually when the cell feels uh, oxygen is the normal level, uh, oxygen um, causes the hydroxylation of uh, uh, the transcription factor if one alpha. Uh, this hydroxylation is, uh, is due by iron enzymes. Uh, that hydroxylate if one alpha if one alpha hydroxylated is recognized by the proteasome and is degraded when oxygen is not present so the cell feels that uh, the, the, the there is an hypoxia event uh, this mechanism doesn't work anymore so if one alpha is not degraded it can go into the nucleus and it can um, uh, it can bind to if one beta uh, if one beta and if one alpha form if one factor that uh, goes to the DNA and activates uh, the transcription of hypoxia recognition, recognition element. Uh, nickel uh, simulates the hypoxia because it substitutes iron in the uh, prolyl and asparagyl enzymes that hydroxylate if one alpha. One of the genes that are activated by this hypoxia response is NDRG1. NDRG1 is a protein involved in uh, a plethora of, of metabolism. The cell is a hub in the, in the cellular metabolism. Most of them are, are, are related to regulation. So cell differentiation, stress response, lipid uh, trafficking and synthesis. And it is also related to some uh, pathological implications such as uh, this Karshomari tooth disease that is a genetic condition uh, for proteins that, um, that have this gene mutated and in person cancer progression. So it's related to cancer. For some cancer, it is uh, a positive prog prognostic marker. For other cancers, such as lung cancer, it is a negative prognostic uh, market, marker. And if we look uh, at the prediction of the network of proteins uh, that are correlated with uh, NDRG1, we see that the network is very big. So the protein interacts with a uh, um, large number of proteins uh, and is involved with a large number of, of metabolisms. Uh, the protein is induced by nickel in cells uh, through the hypoxia pathways, as, as I said before. And here we could see uh, it uh, in ILA cell and in this uh, A549 um, cell line, that is a lung cancer cell line. And the interesting thing is that in, vi in vivo, in cell, uh, the protein exists in different uh, oligomeric states, uh, so monomer, dimer, and tetramer. This was also observed in vitro, so we purified the protein. Uh, we uh, analyzed by uh, SECMAS uh, the oligomeric state, and we see that in solution there is a equilibrium between uh, tetramer, uh, dimer, and monomer. The protein is well folded, usually, mm, so the CD uh, is, uh, contains uh, quite a, a large amount of alpha helices. Uh, helix. Uh, and the protein binds nickel. Uh, we can see by ITC that there are two nickel binding sites, one with higher affinity and one with lower affinity. Uh, so the interesting thing is that this protein that is induced by nickel in the cell is also um, able to bind nickel in the cell. If we look at the structure of, uh, of the protein, we look at the primary structure, we see that the primary structure is very similar to other proteins of the same family. Um, that are other three, NGRG2, three, and four. 
So the structure is very similar with the exception of the C-terminal part of the protein. The C-terminal part of the protein contains a repeat, a decapeptide repeat that is repeated three times. Uh, and from this uh, protein, we have the crystal structure of the protein, but it does not include this C-terminal part of the protein. So it also contains the core of the protein. And it's very similar, also the tertiary structure is very similar uh, for the core to the other proteins of the family, with the exception of this uh, region, alpha-6, uh, that is like a cup that open and close uh, an hypothetical active site that is not active because the, the fold is a alpha-beta hydrolase fold, but the catalytic residues are not present, so it's inactive. Um, <clears throat> So looking at the structure, we have this alpha-beta hydrolysis fold that has been crystallized, and we have a, a short N-terminal domain and a, a quite long C-terminal tail, that is 83 residues. So if this is the structure obtained uh, from the crystals, uh, we can see that it does, is not the end of the story, because uh, if we look at the uh, alpha fold uh, database, uh, so a prediction of the entire structure of the protein, we see a very large space occupied by this C terminal region that is also predicted as disordered. So, our hypothesis was that this part of the protein is actually um, the most important part for the unique, the specific role of the NDRG1 in the cellular machinery uh, because it's the unique part of this protein is not present in the other homo homologues uh, and uh, uh, is also disordered. So it's also possibly involved in the interaction with this large number of proteins uh, to which this protein interact. <clears throat> so we expressed and purify this protein, the, the, the C-terminal tail, this 83 C residue C-terminal tail, and we prove that is actually disordered by C um, by SACMALS, we see that in solution, the protein is a monomer. And we also prove that the protein is able to bind nickel with a pH 7.5, that is the same pH that we used for the entire protein, with uh, the same um, affinity of the higher affinity active uh, metal binding site in the entire protein. So the protein binds two nickel ions per, per uh, monomer and the uh, affinity increases with pH. <clears throat> Looking at the NMR uh, spectrum, HSQC spectrum of the protein at pH 6.5, we can see that the, uh, the, the narrow um, spectrum in the uh, hydrogen dimension is typical of uh, an intrinsically disordered protein, so the protein is very flexible. And uh, with uh, secondary structure propensity, we can see that the, the majority of the protein is in a random coil state, with the exception of this small part uh, that, is, uh, that shows some propensity as an alpha helical. Uh, 76 residues have been assigned, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, most of them include, uh, the, the ones that were not assigned include the uh, N-terminal residues and the yeast res uh, the histidine residues in the protein. We also uh, wanted to see what happens at higher pH, uh, that were the pH that you use for the other analysis that then were more physiological pHs. Uh, so we trace the, uh, the change of the spectrum uh, with increasing uh, the pH, and we see that, that the majority of the peaks disappear at higher pH, probably due to proton, amide proton exchange. Uh, the the C-terminal part of, of the protein seems uh, to be more conserved at higher pH, but in principle, the majority of the signals uh, are gone. So we could not really uh, uh, work with the uh, HSQC spectrum at pH, at neutral pH. <clears throat> so our question was, so the protein binds nickel, where does exactly the protein bind nickel and uh, uh, how? Looking at the primary 
structure of the of the sequence, uh, we see that the, um, the the protein contains five CSP, five histidines. Uh, three of them are in the decapeptide repeat, and uh, but we, we have a problem in studying these histidines at pH 6.5, because at pH 6.5 nickel binds uh, with lower affinity, as we observed by ITC, and also the histidine residues were not uh, observable in the uh, HSQC spectrum. So what we did was to uh, use the uh, carbon-13 HSQC to trace the histidine signals uh, at different pH, so starting from the assigned ones at pH 6.5 to 7.5, and then we titrate nickel over the uh, assigned spectrum at pH 7.5. And we observe that the histidines um, residues um, disappear due, due to the paramagnetism of the spectrum, uh, of, the, of the binding of the nickel site. Uh, and the, uh, the, the histidine that are more affected are histidine 2 and histidine uh, 62, so the, the two extreme histidines. The other histidine disappear, but by a lower extent. So the question that are trying, we are trying to answer now is uh, uh, what is the physiological relevance of this sequence in cell? To answer this question, we have, start, we have started a collaboration with uh, uh, Elisabetta Mileo in Marseille, and uh, we uh, are uh, doing APR spectroscopy, SDL, uh, SDL uh, as uh, APR spectroscopy. So we bind a paramagnetic uh, um, probe to cysteine residues to uh, link it to the protein, and we observe the spectrum, the PR spectrum of the protein. We, to do this, we mutated the three serine residues uh, in three different positions of the protein to cysteine. And we eliminated also the cysteine uh, in the C-terminal position that is the unique cysteine that is present in the primary structure of the protein. And we uh, observed the uh, paramagnetic, uh, the APR spectrum um, for the three positions, so for the three single cysteine variants. And we can see that the, for the, all the three positions, the protein behaves essentially as a random coil protein. The dynamics is very high. Then, this is very preliminary. We try to put the protein inside the E. coli cell by electrophoration. And we see that actually the dynamics is maintained in cell in the three position, even if there is a slight broadening of the spectrum. Uh, so, in conclusion, uh, NDRG1 is a nickel induced and nickel binding protein involved in cancer progression. It exists in an equilibrium between different oligomeric form. The C terminal part is intrinsically disordered and is able to bind two nickel ions using uh, histidines residues. The dynamics of the protein is diffused along the sequence and uh, this behavior is maintained in, in cell. What we want to do now are essentially to go more physiologically, uh, to, to more physiological conditions. So to see what happens, uh, what is the role of post transnational modification? I, as I said at the beginning, the protein is phosphorylated in cell. And also to study the protein uh, in a more physiological environment. So going from E. coli to eukaryotic cells and in particular lung, uh, cells of lung cell line. So for this, I thank uh, my group uh, in Bologna, especially Elena Bagnamina, that was a PhD student that made a large part of this work. Our collaboration, our collaborator, Elisabetta Mileo in Marseille and Vittoria Chen, the CNR of, of Bologna, and also uh, the instructor for the access to uh, the platforms and also Mosbri uh, network that served me to uh, go to Marseille for, for this APR uh, experiment. And thank you for, for your attention. <clears throat> Thanks a lot, uh, uh, 
uh, Barbara for this very interesting presentation. I, uh, are there any questions? Uh, I can, if you just uh, feel free to write them up in the chat and I will read them out. And uh, while maybe we wait, I can start with the first one. You mentioned you uh, focused on the um, histidine side chains with, through NMR, which is uh, actually obvious, obviously interesting, but uh, how about the backbone uh, resonances? Did you monitor any changes in the backbone in uh, some regions that are a bit more remote from yeah, uh, the finding? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the um, as I said, uh, the the um, uh, hydrogen nitrogen HSQC could not be um, is not very useful because there is not many signals. But in the uh, other uh, spectrum, carbon detected spectra, uh, so con uh, spectra, for example, uh, the majority of the signal, a large part of the signal, disappear. Uh, with nickel, so do the paramagnetism of the of the of the metal ion. So the nickel banding seems quite diffuse over the the spectrum, uh, over the over the back, back, backbone. Uh, let's see. So yeah. Good. I think Sonia has a question. I wonder if uh, John can quickly give yes. her unmute yes. her so she can yes, ask. I I have been unmuted. Thanks, okay, thanks cool. so much. Hi, hi everybody. Hi, Barbara. Very, hi. very nice talk. So I have Thank two you. questions. The first one is, uh, do you have any information or are you planning to explore the possible mutual effect of the folded region and the C-terminal region? Or do you have any data about the structural state of the C-terminal in the context of the full and protein? And this is the first question. The second short question is about a possible role of uh, uh, cysteine with uh, uh, histidine in binding to nickel. So in uh, your EPR studies, uh, you um, eliminated the, the, the native cysteine at the end of the, uh, the protein, and uh, you introduced uh, three single uh, cysteine. Uh, um, you made the three single substitutions. So I, I was wondering whether there is maybe some cooperation in binding to nickel between uh, cysteine and histidine and, and perhaps uh, uh, eliminating cysteine more introdu introducing cysteine may somehow impact binding to nickel. This is just a very naive question because uh, I am I'm not at all an expert of binding of nickel. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, okay. The first question was uh, the, the uh, C-terminal region in the context of the entire protein. We have no data for that. I mean, there are some published data that show that uh, the, the, this part uh, is, this contain, is disorder because they um, made the CD spectrum of the entire protein and the, only the full, the, the folded part. Uh, and they see by difference that the C terminal part uh, is still. Uh, random coin like so there is not much secondary structure so it's and there are also some sucks data on the protein that suggests that this part is actually um, uh, is actually mobile so it's big uh, so the 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 c terminal part should remain at least the one not phosphorylated one we don't know what happens when it's phosphorylated because to my knowledge, it has not been uh, isolated in the phosphorylated form. When it is not phosphorylated, the, the, this part is, is still flexible, also when it is attached to the entire protein. Um, we plan to do this. We, at the moment, we are more concentrated to this part to see to study it by isolation. Then, of course, we, the, the final goal would be to put everything together. Uh, about the system, actually, uh, for the um, uh, APR uh, spectra, we uh, mutated serine, not histidine, to cysteine. So, in, in this was to introduce the, param the, the paramagnetic probe. Um, yes, but I was wondering whether uh, a cysteine that has been uh, newly introduced may somehow interfere yeah, with the histidine in binding to nickel or, or in the other way. Or uh, if you have abrogated, you have eliminated the natural uh, uh, system, maybe 
this can uh, affect somehow because maybe there is uh, some cooperation in binding, there is some coordination mm -hmm. between this and insulin. Okay, yeah. Allora, uh, so for the uh, C-terminal cysteine, we don't have evidence at the moment of the binding of this cysteine to the nickel. Uh, but of course, introducing uh, cysteine, it can have an impact in, in nickel binding, even if uh, the, uh, when we label this, the cysteine, we uh, somehow block the, the thiolate uh, with, uh, with the probe. So, um, but it's still possible that there is some, uh, some binding. Um, yeah, so, but, but the, the other thing is that when we put nickel, uh, in the single labeled uh, mm, protein bound to the single labeled two protein, we don't see any change of the spectrum. So in the APR, so it apparently doesn't have an mm -hmm. impact in on the dynamics. Okay, thank you, thank you so much. Best wishes yeah. for the for for the rest of the work. Thanks. Bye bye. Good. So. Uh, thanks again uh, to Barbara for the nice presentation and it was nice to have a stimulating discussion and uh, now I think it's uh, time to hear uh, the highlights by Costas Tocatlidis he is now in the University of Glasgow and will tell us uh, um, some stories about the key mitochondrial oxidoreductase Maya 40 and uh, uh, some interactions with uh, uh, peroxidase. Uh, thank you very much, Isa. Uh, so uh, let me just uh, share my screen here. Okay. Uh, so can you all see that? Yeah? Yes. Good, excellent. Okay, uh, so I'm going Sorry, to. Talk apologies. To... Sorry, you're not in presenter mode. Um, you can only see it as the screen. Is that all right? I just sent um, it. There we go. That's perfect. Good, perfect. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I'm going to talk to you uh, today about this uh, new interaction uh, we have discovered and analyzed directly with the CERN facility. Uh, that has to do with the key protein mitochondria in the intermembrane space of mitochondria, this protein uh, M40. And several years ago, we studied this protein in terms of its function as a chaperone and a key mitochondrial import receptor. And now we find that there is a, a new interaction with a protein called GPX3, which is a thiol peroxidase and gets targeted to mitochondria. Uh, so our interest is on mitochondrial import and biogenesis. So this is just a very generic slide to remind us that mitochondria uh, uh, really pick up essentially all of the proteins from the cytosol after being synthesized in the cytosol. And that process of uh, mitochondrial biogenesis depends really on the import pathways as only uh, 13 proteins are encoded by mitochondrial DNA. So for many years now, we're studying the components of this pathway and the mechanisms and how the proteins get targeted to the intermembrane space. So in terms of the import pathways, there have been studies over the last 30, 40 years, identifying several of them. And you can see here just a cartoon summarizing the key components of these translocons, as they're called, in the outer membrane of mitochondria, which allow passage of proteins into the uh, internal spaces of mitochondria. So for example, we have the main uh, import pathway that brings proteins into the matrix of mitochondria, and this is the presequence pathway. And we have other pathways like the carrier pathway for proteins that really insert into the inner membrane or proteins that get targeted to the outer membrane. And these are largely beta butter proteins or what we studied in the last 10 years in collaboration with CERM is the oxidative folding pathway that involves this key protein here, uh, MIA40. And that normally interacts with another protein, which is a flavin, uh, a flavin uh, protein, ERV1, and then eventually we cytochrome C. 
So in a stepwise manner, what happens in this particular pathway, which is, I should stress, the only one that actually uh, chemically modifies the precursor in terms of adding disulfide bonds into the precursor to stabilize its folding. So it is a stepwise pathway where the precursor, you can see it here, gets into the mitochondria in a reduced state, the cysteine are in a reduced uh, style free form. And then by interaction with MIA40, we have oxidation of uh, the uh, precursor protein and then trapping of this into the intermembrane space of mitochondria. But then MIA40 needs to be uh, reoxidized, and this reoxidation of MIA40 uh, normally occurs by ERV1, sort of from ERV1 to either cytochrome C and cytochrome oxidase or alternative uh, electron adapters. Now, the MIA40 is an absolutely crucial molecule in this pathway because it works like a chaperone, but also as a disulfide donor. So we can see here that the chaperone function together with the disulfide donor function of MIA40 is really what results in the falling of the substrate and uh, retention into the intermembrane space. So we have studied this for uh, using uh, biochemical, biophysical assays, and also uh, uh, using uh, structural analysis in collaboration with our uh, colleague in uh, Florence. And this uh, cartoon here summarizes all this work where we have actually put MIA40 at the core of these interactions, where we have MIA40 interacting either with the substrates, and uh, COX-17 is one of them, where we can see that the interaction occurs via this uh, highlighted here in green. This is a cleft of MIA40, which is very uh, hydrophobic and specific residues of the substrate, which actually uh, are part of the targeting signal, interact with the cleft of MIA40. And this hydrophobic packing results in the proximity of cystine residues, a CPC motif on the uh, MIA40 side to one unique uh, docking cysteine on the substrate side. The result of which is the disulfide bond formation in the substrate, which stably folds it. And then MIA40 uh, gets um, reduced and then recycles back to its oxidized state by ERV1 or ALR as it is called in human cells. And the interesting point in this mechanism is that the recycling protein, this ALR in human cells, so ERV1 in yeast, really behaves like the substrate in terms of the interaction. So it has a, a very extended N-terminal domain that also has a hydrophobic part, and that binds exactly to the same cleft of MIA40, mimicking the substrate. And that mechanism explains how the uh, um, uh, ALR recycles MIA40 back to its oxidized state. So that has all been uh, published, and we understand quite well now mechanism as a biochemical analysis of this pathway, which is absolutely essential, both in uh, simple eukaryotes, but also mammalian and human cells. Uh, it, it is uh, linked to uh, neurodegeneration. So defects in this pathway are linked to uh, several neurodegenerative conditions. MIA40 is also thought to uh, stabilize HIF1 alpha. So it's important for cancer cells and it interacts with another key protein uh, apoptosis inducing factor. So the question was how do mitochondria, uh, how does the mitochondrial biogenesis particularly in this pathway is regulated? Because it was thought that this is just a constitutive process. And then what we discovered is that one protein called uh, GPX3, which is a hydrogen peroxide sensor, really affects the function of uh, MIA4. So in terms of redox signaling and regulation, normally we think about uh, small molecules like hydrogen peroxide or proteins that affect these processes like peroxyredoxins and thyrodoxin. So what we found is that this GPX3, which is normally a hydrogen peroxide sensor in the cytosol, is also localized to the intermembrane space. In the cytosol, other groups have shown that GPX3 uh, really senses hydrogen peroxide. So upon hydrogen peroxide stress, it gets activated through sulfenylation on a unique cysteine. And that results then in an interaction between this protein and YAP1, which is an antioxidant transcription factor that works together with YBP1. And then when this happens, YAP1 is organized in the side. The which is translocated nucleus and then uh, elicits uh, of uh, 
the antioxidants. However, we discovered that when we have uh, high peroxide stress, GPX3 is also localized to the main space of mitochondria. And the question was, how does that happen? And we found that an extension of GPX3 is actually critical for the targeting of the protein to the intermembrane space. So under no stress conditions, we find that the GPX3 normally interacts with uh, uh, YAP1, that's a sort of physiological function, let's say. And under very high stress conditions, what happens is the protein gets alternatively synthesized with an extension. And that extension of nine, uh, 18 amino acid residues allows the protein to get into the intermembrane space where it interacts with MIA40, as I will show you. So the question was, how does the import work in this case, and how do the interactions work for this intermembrane space form of GPX3? So here we have a stress-dependent protein import switch mechanism where GPX3, under hyperoxide stress, uh, picks up this extension and gets into the mitochondria, whereas without the... Uh, 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 stress, uh, small amounts of GPX3 without the extension also make it to mitochondria, but in an, uh, following an alternative pathway that does not depend on TOM40. I'm not going to discuss about this, but I will discuss about this today, where the extension really guides the import of to the mitochondria. How does it work? So first of all, we know that the extension of the N18 is really a efficient targeting signal for uh, import into the intermembrane space. So the GPX3 with the extension gets into the intermembrane space much more efficiently, but it can also be appended to a, a non-mitochondrial protein, and that results in taking this protein uh, into the intermembrane space of mitochondria. So that you can see here, this is the um, uh, fusion protein between the extension and uh, the DHFR, which is a non-mitochondrial protein, goes into the mitochondria when really hooked to this uh, targeting signal. So how does this work? How does the N18 uh, direct proteins into the uh, mitochondria? And here I'm just summarizing uh, in this slide the uh, uh, deletion analysis we did that showed that when we knock out the receptors on the surface of mitochondria, the one that really has uh, an effect is TOM20. And then by looking, you can see the, the data here. So when we knock out TOM20, we really uh, diminish the import of the extended form uh, um, uh, GPX3 into the mitochondria. So the N18 import really depends on the TOM20 and the uh, interactor of 20, which is TOM22. It's a very specific targeting via 20 on the surface of there. And by looking at the sequence 18, we identified a motif that, is, a motif that is normally recognized by TOM20 on other mitochondrial proteins. And in fact, we did a docking experiment where we can see this N18 and in dark blue, this uh, motif here that really fits very nicely to the cleft of TOM20 where uh, precursors normally uh, get bound to. So it interacts with TOM20, but then what happens after that? So we found that the N18 also has an affinity for lipids. So in fact, the IMPO pathway guided by the N18 is very different to other IMPO pathways in the sense that we have a protein-lipid interaction. And you can see here the uh, experiments we did with uh, synthetic lipid vesicles that show that the N18 has an affinity for lipids. The IMPO pathway is for the first time engaging a protein lipid interaction to actually stabilize the GPX3 on the surface of mitochondria where MIA40. So in vivo, this works also. So these are intact cells where we can show that the uh, GPX3 is localized to these uh, mitochondria by confocal microscopy. We also find that GPX interacts, and this is very intriguing, with MIA40, because until now, the only interactors for MIA40 were the substrates and also ERV1. So in fact, we find that in vitro, there is an interaction between GPX3 and MIA40, and also in organello, and GPX3 oxidizes uh, uh, MIA40. By uh, ITC, we can see that the interaction is quite stable and comparable to the one with ERV1. And now I came to the part where uh, Simone and uh, um, uh, Francesca in the uh, CERN facility really uh, uh, identified some very interesting structural changes on GPX3. So basically, we wanted to understand what is happening in terms of the GPX3 structure in the two forms, the reduced and the oxidized form. And we find that they are very drastically different. In fact, the uh, disulfide bond reduction 
allows the transition into a um, of uh, GPX into a form that has an additional helix that is not present in the oxidized form. And that's really important, not just for the protein import and function of GPX3 in mitochondria, but also for the field of antioxidant uh, uh, responses in the cytosol, because that structural basis in interaction with YAP1 is not known. Additionally, this helix formation, you can see here from the data that uh, Simone and others obtained in CERM, you can see that there is this uh, in the reduced form, the secondary structure is very different, and that's the additional helix that is formed. And we are pretty sure that this uh, underpins the interaction with MIA40, which was also studied by both NMR and fluorescence. And we can see here the thermodynamic measurements for the redox potential for GPX3 and for MIA40, which really puts them in a, in a position to interact with each other. And this is the um, data by NMR, and this is the data by uh, fluorescence, where we can see the differences in terms of the reduction and oxidation. And that's the model here where this uh, particular system of uh, GPX, which is the one that's getting activated by hydrogen peroxide through sulfonylation, can interact and really oxidize MIA40. So that's a cartoon showing MIA40 and the important CPC residues of MIA40 that are involved in function. And so in this case, we have a disulfide bond formation on the CPC of MIA40, so oxidation of MIA40, through a completely different mechanism compared to what is the default mechanism by ERV1, which is based on disulfide transfer. So here we have a sulfonylation-based mechanism for oxidation of uh, MIA40. But the question was, what is the physiological relevance of that? Why do we need another protein, which is GPX3, to oxidize and maintain MIA40 in a, a proper state, in a functional state, if we have R1 doing that under normal conditions? And the key to that is that ERV1 is actually modified under high oxidative stress with hydrogen peroxide, is vulnerable to such oxidative damage, and becomes inactive. So upon stress, ERV1 becomes inactive, and therefore the whole pathway would be completely blocked. But it is not because GPX3 comes to the rescue and it involves an interaction. It can now interact with MIA40, sustaining the function of uh, MIA40. So here, uh, I, very quickly, just to show you uh, uh, the data that ERV1 is actually indeed modified. So there were some reports from uh, um, theoretical analysis of uh, modification through methionine uh, sulfoxidation. I don't have the time to go through uh, the uh, data here, but there is uh, here some modification and carbonylation also on uh, ERB1. And we have actually uh, tested that. We have uh, found that uh, ERB1, the purified protein, does indeed get uh, modified. So uh, carbonylated, and we have seen that this happens also in vivo when we treat the cells with hydrogen peroxide. And we can see that this is uh, uh, modified. And uh, in fact, what we also find, and I'm not going to show you the data, is that this modification is linked to two things. First of all, a structural uh, uh, modification. So basically, everyone loses its secondary structure and it becomes inactive. It can no longer uh, uh, be an active oxidant. And uh, what is really important is that the GPX3 can also functionally complement in intact cells the function of ERV1. So this is a physiologically relevant mechanism where a protein that is actually completely unrelated in terms of structure uh, to uh, ERV1 can actually complement the ERV1 defect and therefore sustain the uh, functionality of MIA40. So here we can see the uh, in vivo data where um, uh, ERV1 knocked out cells can survive if we add ERV1, but also if we add uh, GPX3 in the intermembrane space. And that is really intriguing because until now, over 15 years of research on ERV1 and MIA40, no other protein has been identified to functionally complement ERV1 or ALR in, yeast, in human cells. And actually, I should say that the same vulnerability that we find for ERV1, uh, we also find for ALR in terms of oxidative damage of uh, um, ALR.
And that rescue that is uh, by uh, GPX3 is dependent on the peroxidatic system, uh, suggesting that indeed the sulfonylation mechanism of uh, uh, GPX3 is key to sustaining uh, this function in the intermembrane space. So basically, just to summarize, uh, what we find is that the GPX3 provides a bypass to the disulfide relay under oxidative stress conditions, where by the stress uh, through uh, uh, hydrogen peroxide, EV1 becomes inactive. The bypass mechanism uh, engages GPX3, which now becomes active and therefore can function onto MIA40 by a completely different mechanism. This cartoon here summarizes uh, this finding. So uh, the hydrogen peroxide stress on the one hand blocks ARV1, but on the other hand activates GPX3 in mitochondria, and that rescues the MIA40 function. So this can be sustained, and that is really quite critical because uh, we find, I'm not going to show you the data, but we find that the intermembrane space is actually uh, containing a complete antioxidant machinery, very much so like the cytosol with thyroidoxin, and there are interactions between thyroidoxin and GPX3 in the intermembrane space as well as in the uh, in the cytosol. So just a take home messages. So we have a dual localization of a complete antioxidant and reductor machinery in the intermembrane space. There is a stress induced import pathway, which is unconventional uh, for the GPX3 to make it to the intermembrane space. We have revealed a unique vulnerability for the disulfide relay by chemical oxidative modification of ERV1, but then GPX3 comes to the rescue, bypasses the disulfide relay, and endows MIA40 with the capacity to stay functional under these uh, damaging stress conditions. And that is uh, underpinned by a new mechanism that uh, we have been able to uh, start to understand structurally also with the, the, the help of uh, the term facility um, and the support of Instruct. So I will finish here. Thank you very much for your attention. These are the collaborators in uh, CERM. These are the people in my lab, primarily who did most of the work, some collaborators in, um, in Glasgow, and these are our funding. Thanks very much to Instruct that made this uh, uh, work possible in terms of the NMR structural analysis. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks a lot, Costas, for this uh, nice uh, presentation on this intricate mechanism of interactions going on. So I wonder if there are any questions uh, by the audience. Uh, please uh, feel free to either raise your hand or write them up in the chat. Uh, and maybe uh, while we wait, uh, for this, uh, one quick question from my side. I, I was, um, so, I mean, uh, stunned by the large changes you observe in your NMR spectra. And uh, it seemed they uh, relate to a structured part of the protein. So I wanted to ask you to comment a bit more about this. And the second question is, if I'm not wrong, you also had um, uh, N-terminal 18 amino acid, the part of the protein that did not look like structured. And I was wondering if uh, you were able to monitor that and if it has a role in all the yes. uh, intricate mechanism you are looking at. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Isa, for your questions. Uh, first of all, uh, this uh, structural difference, it, it's just stunning. I mean, there's this presence of the helix, which is under reduced conditions, and we're absolutely certain that this transition from a structure that has this very stable helix in a reduced state compared to not having it in the oxidized state really underpins the function, not just with MIA40, we studied MIA40, but also very likely uh, the cytosolic function of uh, uh, GPX3 in binding to YAP1, which is really the main antioxidant transcription factor. It elicits the response of hundreds of genes, including thyroidoxin. So I think, I think that is absolutely critical. Now, going to your second question, which is the N18, you're absolutely right. It is a very extended. It doesn't really have uh, the capacity to fold on its own. We have it as a peptide. It's quite, uh, quite unfolded. Uh, so we haven't studied it structurally on its own, but the fact that it has the capacity to at least interact with TOM20, as well as bind to lipids, suggests that this normally unfolded segments 
uh, has the capacity to uh, you know obtain different structures depending on the interaction uh, partner and i think this is absolutely critical i should also clarify that this n18 extension is not involved in the interaction with mia 40 so all it does really is allows the protein to go through the outer membrane of mitochondria and then inside mitochondria attached to the membrane which is important because mia 40 also sits on the membrane. So it brings to proximity the functional uh, domain of GPX3. And then the interaction is between the functional domain of GPX3, the core domain of GPX3, and MIA40. Okay. But it would be interesting, as you say, to actually understand also with the lipids what's happening to this sort of intrinsically disorder, which I think it is. Segment. Thank you, Costas. Okay, so uh, I think uh, then uh, I would like to thank again uh, the speakers involved uh, in this um, webinar. And uh, I was really happy because it was uh, really interesting highlights about uh, from guests of uh, our infrastructure showing how Chen can contribute to actually bridging uh, atomic resolution information to uh, really functional aspects of uh, proteins. And uh, thanks to Lucia for asking me to uh, chair this webinar and uh, to all of you who participated uh, online. <laughs>